This is our second video where we talk about line integrals over scalar fields. So usually we want to take the line integral with respect to arc length, but there are other useful line integrals. For example, in our definition of the line integral, if we replace delta si with delta x or delta xi, or even delta yi, we can get two other useful integrals. The line integral of f along c with respect to x is defined as follows. So now the only difference in the integral is we have a dx instead of ds, and in the definition we're using delta x sub i, which would just be x sub i minus x sub i minus 1. And just to be clear, x sub i really means x of t sub i. And the line integral uh, along c with respect to y is defined in a similar way. We have our delta y. And if I want to take the sum of two line integrals, one, say, against the component function p with dx, and the other against the component function q with dy, we just write that together using two uh, of the differentials there. So dx and dy in, with only one integral sign. It's just a shorthand notation. But there's a reason for this shorthand. If we think of it in terms of vectors, if we think of a, a p and q as being our component functions of the vector field f, and then we think of this vector differential being dx dy, then p dx plus q dy is really just uh, the vector field f dotted with this vector differential dr. So parameterizations or parametric representations are going to be very important in this chapter. So let's do some review for uh, parameterizing curves. So when we're looking at a circle or an ellipse, we're going to use uh, cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. So suppose we want to find a parametric representation of the following ellipse, 4x squared plus 3y squared equals 12. Well, we want the right-hand side to equal 1. So we'll divide everything by 12. I get x cubed squared over 3 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. And I could look at that as the fraction x over radical 3 squared plus the fraction y over 2 squared equals 1, which suggests that the x over radical 3 should be cosine of t and y over 2 should be sine of t. So that would lead to x being radical 3 cosine t, y equals 2 sine t, and we're only going to go around the ellipse once, so 0 is less than or equal to t, less than or equal to 2 pi. If y is a function of x, so in other words, y is dependent on x, x is the independent variable, we'll let the independent variable be the parameter, and then use the formula for f to find the parametric equation for y. So for example, if I have y equals 4 minus x squared, here x is the independent variable. I've solved for y. And uh, I'm going from uh, the point 0 comma 4 on the uh, y-axis to 2 comma 0 on the x-axis. 
So again, our independent variable x becomes the parameter t. And then I just use this formula now with my parameter. And how do I know the values? Well, I look at my points here and the x values start at zero, they go to two. So t goes from zero to two. As we saw in a previous example, if x is a function of y, then we're going to say that y is our independent variable. So we'll let that be the parameter t. And we'll use the formula that's given for x to uh, determine the parametric, parametric equation for x. So here in another example, uh, we have uh, the equation 8xy equals xy cubed minus 32. Now, it would be really challenging to solve this equation for y. It's a cubic equation in y. However, it's a fairly straightforward algebra to solve this for x. So that would be our first step. So now we can see that x depends on y. y is the independent variable. Uh, it is the y value. I'm looking at the y value now. It goes from 2 to 4. And so I would have uh, y equals t. x equals 32 over t cubed minus 8t. And t going from 2 to 4. All right, so we looked at parameterizing a circle or ellipse. We looked at when I have one, fun one variable written as a function of the other. And then the last uh, case, which is a worthwhile special case, is if we want to look at a line segment going from A to B. We saw this from back when we studied uh, first started studying vectors and lines. Um, here's an equation of a line segment. We just make this affine combination. So the first multiplier is 1 minus t times the position vector for a, and then just t is the second multiplier times the position vector for b. And you can see when that t equals 0, uh, the position vector of b drops out. I'm just left with the position vector for a. And on the other hand, when t equals 1, the position vector for a drops out. And I'm left with the position vector for b. So here's an example. We'd like to find a parametric representation of the line segment starting at 4, 0 and going to 1, 2. And one thing we should notice is that we're actually starting uh, on the right side of the line segment and going to the left. And uh, so this is where this formula is particularly useful, uh, where we're traversing in an unnatural direction. Normally we want to go from left to right, but here we're going from right to left. But this formula uh, really uh, doesn't really care which direction you're going. So I put 1 minus t in parentheses times the position vector of my first point, which will just be 4 comma 0, plus t times the position vector of the final point, which is 1 comma 2. And with this formulation, or this parameterization, t always goes from 0 to 1. And so I can clean that up, collect some like terms. So then, I get uh, 4 minus 3t as my first component function, 2t as the second component function, meaning that x is 4 minus 3t, y is 2t. And again, t goes from 0 to 1. So in this formulation, I'm not looking at the coordinates to determine the values of t, because I'm not using t as one of the 
uh, coordinates, one of the coordinate variables, I am uh, using this particular formulation. And in that case, t always goes from 0 to 1. Another thing that's going to be important to us is the notion of orientation. In what direction do you traverse your curve? So your parameterization determines that. We just saw a line segment where we came up with a parameterization where we traverse that line segment from right to left. And we could have come up with a different parameterization where we go from left to right. We use a minus sign in front of the C for the curve so to indicate that we're going to traverse the curve in the opposite direction of the given parameterization. So instead of traversing it the way the parameterization uh, tells us, we're going to go in the opposite direction. And there's a lot of reasons why we would do that. For example, it might be easier to evaluate the integral. Or it may be a, a simpler way to set up the parameterization. Now, for line integrals, which you're taking with respect to x or with respect to y, um, if I traverse the curve in the opposite direction, the result is we're going to change the sign on the value of the integral. And this is just like back in Calc 1, where we uh, reversed the bounds. So instead of going from A to B, we went from B to A. If you think about that, that means we're traversing that particular line segment on the x-axis. Instead of going from A to B, we're going from B to A, so it changes the sign. And if you think back to the definition, uh, our definition does have a uh, orientation associated with it. So if I go in the opposite direction, of that orientation, then I've changed the order in which I count my xi's, and so my delta x is going to be have a different order, meaning it'll have a different sign. And the same thing is true with the line integral with respect to y for the same reason. However, for line integrals with respect to arc length, if I uh, reverse the orientation, the value of the line integral does not change. And the reason for that, you can see that since the delta si in our definition is the square root of the sum of the squares, then the sign on these delta x and delta y terms really uh, does not matter. You're still going to have uh, whether I put a minus sign in there, I'm going to square it, so it's going to go away. Now we can perform uh, line integrals over functions of three variables uh, over a space curve C. And we would just define it in the same way. Our ds now just has three terms in it. We're still going to have the square root of the sum of the squares, but now we have a z prime squared in addition to the x prime squared plus y prime squared. And whether I have two variables or three variables, my vector notation still holds true here. So we're really looking at f of r of t times the length of r prime of t. That is a shorthand for what we've written up here. And since we can now define a line integral with respect to z, if I have a vector field with three component functions, so vector field over R3, I can write my vector differential dr having components dx, dy, and dz. And so my line integral of f dotted with dr, I can write using this shorthand here. So I really have three line integrals in one here, one with respect to dx, one with respect to y, one with respect to z. 
So let's look at uh, an example in 3D. Let's evaluate the line integral of y sine z over the curve c, which is a portion of the helix, x equals cosine t, y equals sine t, and z equals t. And we're only going to go from 0 to pi on the helix. So let's use our parameterization and figure out what is ds. Now, the derivative of x is just negative sine of t. The derivative of y is cosine. The derivative of z is just 1. But sine squared plus cosine squared will be 1. So I'm going to have 1 plus 1 square root of that. In other words, radical 2 times dt. So let's set up our integral then. Our parameterization goes from 0 to pi. Those are the bounds of the integral. y, we said, is sine of t. Sine of z will be another sine of t, because z equals t. And then ds is radical 2 dt. So I'll pull the radical 2 out in front. Uh, for sine squared of t, I'll use my identity. So I'll have 1 half, so now radical 2 over 2. Uh, 1 minus cosine of 2t. And go ahead and find the antiderivative. I see that uh, the sine of 2t, when evaluated from 0 to pi, is not going to make any contribution because sine of 0 is 0 and sine of 2 pi is also 0. So I'm just left with pi minus 0. So radical 2 over 2 pi. So we still have yet to look at line integrals over vector fields uh, as opposed to scalar fields, but that'll come in the next video.